Howdy folks, welcome back for another lesson in the Microsoft AEZ 800 course. Today we're going to be talking about virtual networks on the Microsoft Azure side of things. These virtual networks can be used for many purposes, but today we'll keep it simple and use them on virtual machines in the cloud on Microsoft Azure. Okay, so let's jump right into things and start off by discussing what are virtual networks. Now for the folks brand new to virtual networks, this is kind of the same as virtual switches you get on Hyper-V on premises if you've ever seen those or used those. Except with virtual networks on the Azure side, you have way more functionality. Now like on Hyper-V where you would use virtual switches to give your virtual machines network capability so they can communicate with each other, communicate with the host, or communicate with the outside world, like the internet, these virtual networks on the Azure side of things have the same function except way more than just that. The virtual networks are used to link things in the cloud like your virtual machines, so they can obviously communicate with one another. You can also put them on different networks and you can configure the IP addressing and subnetting much like you would do on premises. Something else these virtual networks can do, which is where things start to get interesting, is you can use these same virtual networks to link infrastructure in the cloud to infrastructure on-premises. If you do it correctly, your users or your clients on-premises would now be connecting to stuff that's in the cloud and they would not even know. So this stuff would normally be on-premises and now it's moved to the cloud and they are basically none the wiser. And quite frankly, they don't need to know. The less they know in most cases, the better. There's just less issues that way. As long as it all works, and as long as all the users, all the clients can do whatever it is they need to go and do from a day-to-day -day base, that's mission accomplished, folks. So something else folks should also be aware of though is when it comes to connecting resources in the cloud together, your resources by default have to all reside in the same region. Basically what we're saying here is your stuff needs to all be in the same data center, whichever one you decide to go with. As soon as you have your stuff in more than one region, they won't by default be able to communicate with each other. The key word here is by default. So it's most definitely still possible to connect your resources together even though they might reside in different regions you still need to make use of virtual networks to do this, but now you're also going to be making use of things like VPNs and such. All right, folks, let's quickly give you a demo as to where on the Microsoft Azure portal you can find the virtual network component and then also how you can go about creating yourself a basic one. I'm going to switch over to the Azure portal now, so let's just quickly switch over. All right, folks, here we are on the Azure portal. So. I'm going to go click here on my little navigation menu and the component I'm looking for today is obviously virtual networks. There we have it, virtual networks. Now it goes about saying this can be accessed via like a million different ways. It depends, you know, on you, how you want to go and do it. This is probably one of the quickest ways. I'm going to go and click on that component. And now for the folks that's not familiar with virtual networks, this is an example of infrastructure as a service, IaaS. So depending on if you've watched my previous videos, you would know you get different kinds of cloud, public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. Now within the public cloud section, you get software as a service, you get platforms as a service, and you get infrastructure as a service. Things like virtual machines and virtual networks is an example of infrastructure as a service. So it's something hosted in the cloud, but you still have a lot of control over it. So out of those three forms of public cloud I just mentioned, I would say infrastructure as a service is the one where you still have the most amount of control over that component, whatever it might be. Now, normally if you go to this section of the Azure portal, assuming it's a brand new portal, this will probably be blank. If it's an existing Azure environment, there's most likely going to be one or many here. I've got one here because I've got a bunch of virtual machines that I've made, and they went ahead and made their own little virtual network. So I'm going to ignore that one. You can ignore that one for now. So if you want to make yourself your own virtual network, you can go here and click on create. So let's go and do that quickly. And there we go. So like with most components on the Azure portal, there's obviously a bunch of tabs here at the top. You can choose whether you want to go into those. Some people do, some people don't. 
The only ones we need to be focusing on today is the one that says basics or basics. Yeah, it's basics and IP addresses. So here on the subscription, if you have more than one kind of subscription for your environment, you can go and choose it from the drop down list. I'm currently using a trial, so I only have the one. Resource group, if you have one, you need to go and choose it. If you want to go and use one of your existing ones. If you don't have one, you're going to have to go and create yourself one. And for the folks not familiar with resource groups, if I have to explain it in a nutshell, that's basically a logical grouping of components. How you go and group your things and why you group your things the way you do is completely up to you in the end of the day. I can, for example, go and create a resource group where I group all my components in a, city, a certain city together. Maybe all my components in New York. It doesn't matter if it's a website, a virtual machine, a database. The point is, as long as it's under that branch, being the New York office branch, I'm going to go and choose that resource group. I can make another one for a different town, a different country, or you can go make groups by the kind of components. So maybe I've got a resource group specifically for virtual machines. It doesn't matter where they are. As long as it's a virtual machine, I'm going to go and chuck them into that resource group. If it's a database of some kind, like a SQL database, I'm going to go and chuck it into the databases group. So like I said, how you create these, why you create these, and how you use them, that's up to you and your imagination. So I'm going to go and create a brand spanking new one. I'm going to go click here on create. I'm going to call it RG for resource group. Okay. Give it a name. It doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to call it VNet because Microsoft loves using the word VNet for virtual networks. So I'm going to call it, oh, let's call it VNet1. Region. So you see, that's the regions we were speaking of earlier. So depending on what region you're choosing, that might be very far away from you. It might be close to you. It might have certain functionality. It might not have it. Ideally, you want to choose a region as close as possible to you and in your country because that's obviously going to have less latency. You need to be careful, though, because there's different costs involved. Just because it's all Microsoft does not mean you're going to be paying the same price for these regions. Each region has their own functionality. Some have more functionality than others. Some have different prices, obviously. Some are cheap, some are expensive. And then, obviously, you want to go and check latency. If something's going to be very far away, you're going to have latency. In other words, a lag in plain, simple terms. So I'm going to keep it to East US because unfortunately in the trial subscriptions, they are for the most part limited to the East United States. But if you've got yourself a real subscription, you can go and choose a different region here. I'm limited to East US at the moment because of using a trial. Now I'm going to go here to IP addresses. I suppose I can leave this on the default. You know, the point is just to show you guys where you would go and create this. But you have the ability to go and choose your IP address range here. And I can even go and make subnets within that range. So you can see here for the guys that know networking, more specifically subnetting, that's a class B network. And here, that's a class C network. So that's like a subdivision within that division. So you can go and make yourself a network and subdivide it into smaller networks if I have to put this into simple terms. So just to show you, I can now go here and I can go and delete that. Deletes the subnet obviously with it automatically. And I can go and suck something out of my thumb here and say 192.168.1.0 forward slash 24. That's a normal class C, not class B, class C network. You see it accepts that. And if I want, I can go and add subnet or subnets here. I'm going to go click on that. The name doesn't matter. It's uh, the principle that matters. I'm just going to call it sub1 for subnet1. And then normally this network here would normally be smaller, a division of the big one here. Now, I'm going to make it the same today, but generally speaking, you would make it something smaller, a subdivision of that one. You know, you want to go and subdivide it. I'm going to go and add it there. I'm going to go click on Review and Create. It's going to just go and check my things out and make sure everything is okay. Give it a sec. A few moments later. There we go. Everything seems to check out. I'm going to go click on Create. And generally speaking, creating these virtual networks goes relatively quick. In most cases, creating a normal virtual network takes you anywhere between a few seconds to maybe about a minute or two. But as soon as you want to go a little bit deeper, if you want to go and connect this virtual network to on-premise infrastructure, because that is something you can go and do, it takes a lot longer. You're going to have to create your normal virtual network, which is what we're doing right now. And then you need to go and configure something called a gateway. Configuring a gateway is pretty quick. But creating it is going to take you forever. That's something you guys need to worry about. You know, the configuration side is going to be very quick and easy. It's going to take you like a minute or two to go and configure all of that. But once you hit that create button, 
it could potentially take you up to an hour. So I normally may arrange my things in such a way so that I click on the create button just before lunch and then voila, done. Here we go. So you can see it's done. I can now go here to uh, virtual analytics there, or I can go click there. Potato, potato, doesn't matter. I'm going to go click there. You can see there's my new virtual network. And if I go click on that sucker, it opens a blade for that component. And at the moment, it's pretty blank. It's pretty default. It doesn't get more default than this. So what's going to happen here is if you eventually have components like virtual machines connected to this virtual network, each and every virtual machine will display here with their name and their IP address. What you will notice though is it's normally going to go and add three random letters at the back or random numbers. It's normally random numbers. So if, if my virtual machine for argument's sake is called virtual machine one or VM one for short, just VM one, you'll find it's going to be called here. It's going to be listed as VM one, but you're going to see like four numbers. So it's going to be VM one and then maybe two, four, five, or, you know, it's going to be four numbers. So it gets a bit confusing. So just as long as you know that the last three numbers are just random, then you'll be able to keep track of what is what. You know, just remember, it's going to add three random numbers there at the back. So it works similar to what you would see on a DHCP server on-premises, and it's not exactly the same. But if you've ever had the opportunity to go into a DHCP server on-premises, you would notice you can actually go and check which IP addresses have been dished out so far and to which devices. And obviously, you can go check things like the lease and things like that. Here you can see which devices have been connected to this virtual network and what IP address they've got, the subnet, all that kinds of stuff. So it's pretty cool in that sense to see if they are on the same network in that case. All right, folks, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so let's have a quick chat about communication with on-premises resources. Since I did kind of touch on that while I was doing my demo, I mentioned to you guys you're going to have to go and create something called a gateway. Now, as we stated earlier, one of the benefits of virtual networks is you have the ability to connect your infrastructure in the cloud to infrastructure on premises. The way this is achieved is obviously a virtual networks, but you're also going to be making use of things like VPN, similar to what you would do with resources that's in different regions, obviously now. Now, when connecting stuff in the cloud to on premises, there are different types of connections you can use. The first one is called a point to site virtual private network. The second is a site to site virtual private network. And then lastly, Azure Express Route or Express Route. You, know, you might pronounce that differently depending on what country you're in. So the first one being point to site, this is when you set this up so that only one specific PC on premises can connect resources in the cloud using the virtual private network. The benefit to this is it changes almost nothing on premises. Everybody else at the office is going to go on of their day and they work exactly like normal, none the wiser. Only the specific individuals who need access to these resources, whatever it might be, only they will have access, will have access to it. So you might find you've got yourself a hundred or even a thousand users or clients here and only one, two, or three of them actually need access to a specific resource. And only they will have access to this resource, depending on who you set this up for. So it's basically a one-to-many, if you want to go and call this something. With the site-to-site -site VPN, that's when everyone on-premises has access to this resource on Azure, whatever it might be. You're going to have to set this up, though, so that it connects to your on-premises VPN server, so you're going to have to create that gateway we spoke of earlier. Creating the gateway, as I've said earlier, usually takes a very long time. It's not so much the configuration side of things. I mean, that part is relatively quick. It's easy. It's straightforward. It's once you need to actually go and click on that create button on the Azure portal. That is where the wait starts. I've had it take up to an hour in some cases. So as I've said earlier, I normally arrange my things in such a way so that if I know I'm going to go on lunch or something, I click on the create button just before I go for lunch. And I normally when I get back from lunch, it's either done or just about to finish. So it's all about time management, as I've said before. And then the last one here, guys, is Azure Express Route. It allows you to connect via partner, a private partner's route to the Azure resources. Benefit is it's obviously a little bit more secure, a little bit more private. 
and you do not need to make use of the public internet. I mean, obviously, everybody has got access to the internet, as you guys know it, and there's about 8 billion people in the world. And as you know, the average person has about two free devices these days. So that's about between 8 and 24 billion devices could potentially try and hack you or intercept your communication. I mean, that is crazy. So why not rather use a secure connection like the express route, which is becoming more popular by the day? All right, and then lastly, folks, I want to add one extra topic here for you guys, which is filter network traffic. When it comes to filter network traffic, we have the following components, network security groups and network virtual appliances. So starting the first one here being network security groups, these security groups and application security groups can contain multiple inbound and outbound security rules that enable you to filter traffic to and from resources by source and destination using things like IP address, the port, and protocol. Pretty useful, right? I mean, that is very useful. And Looking at our second one here being network virtual appliances, this is a virtual machine that performs a network function such as firewall, WAN optimization, or other network functions. So that's pretty much what it is. It's going to be a virtual machine that's going to perform or pretend to be something like a firewall for the most part. And that's pretty much the basics of virtual networks, folks. So there's obviously way more to all of this, and it gets much, much deeper than the things I've explained in this video. But you've got to start somewhere, right? And this is obviously a very good place for you guys to start if you're brand new to this. Okay, everyone, if you found this useful, please poke the like button. And if you'd like to stay up to date as to when I release new training videos, remember to also hit that subscribe button. Lastly, folks, just a special thank you to the Patreon supporters of this channel. So thank you very much, guys, for sponsoring the channel. And if you'd like to also sponsor this channel or donate, you can find all that information in the video description down below. All right, folks, have a Merry Christmas in case you guys are watching this video during Christmas. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.